and you're ready to go. Thanks, Teresa. Good evening, everyone. Um, and as Grover said, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm pleased tonight to introduce Nicole Leparacci, who is a graduate student um, at the University of Rhode Island in the Master's in Environmental Science and Management program. Her expertise is in Geographic Information System, or GIS, which is mapping and analysis software that helps us um, understand issues and problems. One of the issues that we wanted to better understand was as Grover mentioned, what is the exposure that Rhode Island and particularly Rhode Island coastal communities have to sea level rise uh, and storm surge? Well, we don't really have the in-house capability uh, nor the time to do this type of analysis. However, Nicole, as a graduate student, did. So we approached the university and my good friend and colleague, Dr. Peter August, who is mentoring uh, and advising uh, Nicole, I know Peter, you were here somewhere, there you are. And by the way, Peter is the godfather of GIS in Rhode Island, having started the Rigis system in Rhode Island some 30 plus years ago. So thank goodness for that. Um, and, indeed. So um, Nicole will explain to you what she did for her analysis. Um, and then that information that she will be providing through us will be available um, through the Beach Samp website for all 21 coastal communities as well as a statewide total. Now, bear in mind, this is not any type of socioeconomic analysis. This is strictly looking at what is the data telling us for the exposure for individual points um, on the map. And by the way, this was a wonderful collaboration between the university and the state agency, the CRMC, where we didn't have to go out and get federal funding or go to the General Assembly or the governor's office and ask for money to do this project. We went to the university. They were able to supply us a wonderfully capable and talented person to do this type of analysis. And Nicole's part, she got a wonderful project to do as part of her master's work. So this was a fabulous collaboration between the university and the state. So with that, Nicole, um, take it away and show us what you found out. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, so I'm first going to start off with telling you about the objectives of the project. I will then get into some background leading into the methods and finally, I'll be showing you some of the results that this project had. So we had two main project objectives. The first is we wanted to provide information for coastal planning using this GIS tool to analyze vulnerability of structures to sea level rise and storm inundation. So we did this separately and also together. We also want to provide an overview for state, local officials, and the public of structures exposed to coastal inundation for all 21 coastal muni municipality. The background for this came from storm tools um, which most of you, I'm sure, have heard of already. And Storm Tools shows maps of storms plus sea level rise, and it does this using LIDAR and digital elevation models in Rhode Island, which are really great. It's an amazing tool. So we wanted to take it a step further, take those digital elevation models, and actually quantify those structures in each community and how these digital elevation models are affecting these structures. So we want to get a bigger picture that illustrates future flooding risk to the different areas in each coastal community. <laughs> and the first step is to understand the difference between storms versus sea level rise, because they are different. Storms are short term, the episodic and sporadic, and the flooding is usually driven by storm surge and precipitation. For this project, we focused on storm surge. And sea level rise is regular, it's lasting and it coincides with the tidal cycle and we know that as the years go on, sea levels are continuing to rise. And these rising seas are due mostly to climate change and climate change includes the thermal expans expansion of oceans and melting glaciers and ice sheets. And we know in the past the historic rate from 1930 to 2015 has been about 2.72 millimeters per year in Newport. And this is from the Newport tidal uh, gauge. And this figure right here is really great because it shows estimated relative sea level change projections from 2010 to 2100. So on the y axis, you have feet of sea level rise, and the x axis, you have your year. And that blue top line, uh, which is this blue curve up here, 
represents the NOAA's highest projection rate. And those gold stars represent the associated planning horizons. So for a sea level rise of one foot, you're going to see a horizon, um, planning horizon of around the year 2035. And then for a sea level rise of seven feet, we're looking to see that in the year 2100. So again, we explained how we use GIS, which was a great tool for this, to um, assess these impacts. And the first step was to take out those 21 coastal communities. So right here is just a graphic showing those 21 coastal communities in Rhode Island, and Block Island is included in this. And the next step was to pick the scenarios which we wanted to study. And we have sea level rise and both storm return period. For sea level rise in feet, we decided to focus on one, two, three, five, and seven feet. And then we have storm return period, which is in year. And we have 10, 25, 100, and 500. And what this return period in year actually means is a probability for us to decide how often the storm is hitting land in a year. So for example, our 10 year re return period would be a one in 10 chance that this storm be hitting land um, within a year, and, or one in 25 chance for the 25 return period. That's about a 4% chance of this storm hitting land within a year period. Finally, we also looked at sea level rise and storm inundation together. So that's the same sea scenarios for sea level rise, one, two, three, five, and seven. And then we added on top of that the 10, 25, and 100 year uh, return period. To do this, we had two relevant data sets. The first one was that raster data from Storm Tools, the digital elevation model that I had talked about earlier. And this uh, raster data shows the extent and depth of flooding, and it shows this in feet. And then we also had point data. And this point data comes from the E911 database, which can be found on RIGIS and it is downloadable. And each of these contains one point for a structure in Rhode Island. So in this graphic image, that kind of looks all muddled together, but later on I'll show you a zoomed in version and you can see each individual structure in, in the community. And with this comes a database that explains the town the structure is in, the address, and also the site type, which I'll also be explaining. It gets very specific with the type of structure you will be looking at. And we put these two um, data sets together and made a model in GIS. And so this model looks really large, and you don't need to know GIS um, for this, what I'm about to explain. The main tool that you should be focusing on is this tool right here. It's called Extract Values to Points. And what this does is it takes that E911 data set, which are points, lays them over the inundation raster, which was that flood extent, and for every point, it will give me uh, the raster uh, in feet of water that is at that point. Um, and it brings all that together so I can make one data sheet. To explain that a little more closely, I have this image right here. So here's those points, and when you zoom in, you can see that they're each individual structures. And we laid them over that raster layer, which is that colorful layer underneath. When I ran this tool, I had an example of one structure point uh, for the top point right there. Um, it gave me the city, which is Warwick in this case, an address, a site type, let's say it was P4, which is code for an educational building, and then a sea level of two feet. So now I actually have a number of sea level in feet associated with that structure. If that point did not lie over any raster um, in feet, you'll see the other example I have, which is right here, this point, will have the same information, so the city, the address, the site type, but a sea level of zero feet, which means that it should not be exposed to any water level. And I did this for all the structures in each community um, in, uh, along the coast of Rhode Island. And so I have one giant master spreadsheet of this information. So the next step would be to decide how we wanted to display this type of data that we were getting. And so we had to process the elevations. And what we decided on was to create Excel spreadsheets for each municipality. So there's 21 separate coastal spreadsheets. And there's also one statewide spreadsheet, which is just contains all of the coastal communities together as a whole. And then inside these spreadsheets, each tab represents a different scenario. And every spreadsheet is the same. It contains the same information. And this was also done, this analyzation was done using RStudio, which is a statistical tool. And instead of going and showing you the Excel spreadsheet, which is a lot of numbers thrown at you, a little confusing if it's on a projector screen, 
I'm going to take the time to go through some of the information separately of what you will be seeing. So the first, uh, the first part of the information that you'll be able to see are the structures. What type of structures are in this town? What structure categories are in this E91 database? So they're very specific with the type of structure. Those uh, that are in black include such as hangars, accessory buildings, airports. They even have public telephones on there, which I haven't seen in a very long time. Um, and then the, the ones highlighted in red are the ones we felt were also the most important to just pick out for you guys. So those are our commercial, industrial, public service, residential, and utility. And what we can do is take our commercial, our residential, and public service and the E911 database breaks that down even further into subcategories. And those are located here. So what are the substructure categories? For commercial, we have a coded through C1 through CF, and those include other commercial, commercial farm and lodging. Public service um, includes many different types of public service structures, such as government, healthcare facilities, those are the hospitals. Educational, those are a lot of our schools police, fire, ambulance houses, so very important structures to the community. And then finally, we have residential, which is R1 through R6, and those include our single family, multi-family, mobile home, other residential, seasonal home, and camps. So it's split up very nicely for us already uh, through the E911 database. And once we have these categories separated, I can find out specific information about the types of categories in each town. So what do the combined data tell us? So in each spreadsheet, uh, I have a really nice table, and these ta this table is split up into these categories and subcategories, and you'll be able to find this information for each type of those structures. And this includes a list of the number of exposed buildings, so those that are seeing some level of water. We'll have the total buildings in the whole town, um, we'll then have the number of total buildings exposed in a sea level rise 7, 100 year storm scenario. And the reason we have this is because we wanted an example of the maximum flood extent we are seeing. So the maximum flood extent is our worst case scenario, we like to call it, in this analysis. And we'd like to get a better picture of how many buildings are affected just out of that larger envelope. Because there are some buildings in that entire town that really aren't going to see any water. Um, not, uh, not anything under a sea level rise of seven 100 year storm. From there, you can go on to get percent of buildings exposed in town, percent of buildings exposed out of that larger envelope. You'll have the number of buildings inundated in different intervals and in feet. And so these intervals will include zero to two or zero to five, two to four or five to 10, four to six or 10 to 15, or greater than six and greater than 15. And depending on which scenario, you'll see different intervals, just because a sea level rise of two feet only, we'll probably use a zero to two feet interval because we're just not going to see any buildings between 10 to 15, greater than 15 feet. And finally, you'll be able to see the mean, min, and max elevation of water. So that's a lot of information at once. And what I'm going to do for you is give you an example so you can see a better picture of that. So this is the same exact list, but with actual real numbers. This is a Warwick, the city of Warwick, and this is a sea level rise of five feet. And the category I've chosen to show you is residential single family, which is coded R1. In this case, the number of exposed buildings is 154. This is out of 27,338 single family homes in the whole town, which is about 0.6% of the town being exposed to water. And then 5,011 5, um, buildings are exposed under our worst case scenario. So that's about 3.1% uh, of exposure for the, out of the maximum flood extent. And then finally, we have number of buildings inundated by zero to two feet, uh, two to four, four to six, and greater than six. You can see that most buildings will be exposed uh, to between zero to two feet of water. And then a mean, a min, a max, with our mean being 0.9 feet, and we also have our max at 3.1 feet of water. So that's, again, a lot of information, and this is for every single category for every single um, town. We also have totals. So those were based on categories and subcategories, but we also have totals for all the buildings exposed, all the different categories combined in that town. And right here, we just wanted to show you um, what Grover was talking about earlier, how when you have sea level rise and add on top of it that 100-year storm, 
we see a greater, a much greater number of exposed buildings. So on our top figure, on our y-axis, we have number of exposed buildings, and on our um, x-axis, we have sea level rise, and just, this is just sea level rise, so one, two, three, five, and seven feet. And I have those actual numbers um, to the right of that graph. So sea level rise of one uh, foot, zero, the zero buildings are exposed. But we go all the way up to sea level rise of seven feet, and that's 592 buildings exposed in Warwick. And then the bottom figure shows the same scale, and again, on the y-axis is number of buildings exposed, and the x is at sea level rise with the 100-year storm surge, and our numbers increase drastically. So we're talking about a sea level rise um, of one foot with the 100-year storm is 3,456. That's a big difference from just our zero when it's just one foot of sea level rise. And then we have our maximum flood extent, our worst case scenario, is 5,689 buildings. And this is out of the total, which you can see on top of the town, uh, which is 34,479. So quite a lot of damage with our worst case scenario. We also took it a step further inside of these spreadsheets, and we have the same graph that I just showed you. This is just sea level rise scenario. And what we did is we created summary tables so you can go inside of these tabs and see summary tables of those most important assets structure-wise. So I had told you about how um, we have those top five structures, commercial, industrial, public service, residential, and utility. And so we decided to make summary tables of these assets so it make it easier for you to go and look at these. Uh, these pie graphs just represent that you can go in and see the number of buildings for each of these categories. If we look at sea level rise of two feet, Mostly commercial buildings are affected, but as the um, sea level rise increases, it switches over to mostly residential being affected. And we also see that there is um, public service exposed as well. And we did the same thing for a sea level rise and 100 year storm scenario. And so here you see that residential is definitely the most exposed and impacted. Again, this is just Warwick, but you can go and see this for every single uh, municipality and we'll have those summary tables for each one. We also decided to take summary tables of some of the public service categories, and that includes an ambulance house, fire stations, healthcare facility, police, schools, and government. So again, we chose these based on what we thought were important assets to each community in Rhode Island. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for you to go inside the spreadsheet instead of looking at this giant list of all these categories and subcategories, you can quickly just go and look at these if that's what you're looking for. From sea level rise of one foot, you see some hospitals, um, ambulance house, and fire stations. And as, time, as the sea level rise increases, you'll see more and more schools being affected. Again, those specific numbers you can find inside each spreadsheet. We also have a spreadsheet just for the 21 coastal communities combined. We want to show you some numbers from those. This right here is a table showing exposed residential structures. So this is only residential, R1 through R6, combined 21 coastal communities. So all of those combined together. And on top, you'll see the scenarios, which are three feet, five feet, seven feet, and 100 year storm surge. We just picked these to show as an example. It showed a nice range of numbers. For exposed residential, under three feet, you're seeing about 480 buildings. In a 100-year storm surge, it jumps all the way to 14,266. And that is without any sea level rise. That is just a 100-year storm surge. Underneath, I gave some percentages to get a better idea of how much of, of the coastal towns are being affected. Um, the percent exposed for coastal towns is that percentage out of all the towns combined together. So a sea level rise of three feet, about 0.2% of buildings would be affected. And then for a 100-year storm surge, almost 6% of buildings will be affected with all those uh, towns combined. And then finally, I had the same numbers inside that sea level rise seven 100-year maximum flood envelope. So very similar to what we did with the separate subcategories and categories. But this is just an overview as a whole for the, all the communities in the state. And this uh, table right here is showing you a ranking of those towns with the most exposed residential buildings under each scenario. And this changes drastically from scenario to scenario. A lot of different towns have, have tipping points, so 
they'll have a certain number of residential buildings exposed, and then one scenario will come, and all of a sudden, it'll, the numbers will jump drastically. Uh, just as an example, sea level rise of three feet. It's being ranked from one to five, with, which, with one being um, the highest number of exposed buildings, and five being the least out of the top five 21 coastal communities. So for three feet, we have South Kingstown seeing the most exposed buildings, followed by Westerly. Five feet is switches, so Westerly, and then South Kingstown. Seven feet is the same, but then for 100 year storm surge, completely different towns, we see Warwick and Barrington as being the top two, with the highest number of exposed residential buildings. So again, this changes drastically from scenario to scenario. So all of this is a lot of information, is a lot more information than even what I showed you. So for future results, we are going to have data and format for the analysis, again, later available this fall on the Beach Stamp website. And that information will include separate Excel spreadsheets for each of the 21 coastal communities. We'll also have that cumulative statewide total spreadsheet for all the communities together. And we'll have a report detailing the project results, including the methodology used in this analysis. And finally, as an end note, I have a map that we have prepared for you, and I'm hoping to have some more of these maps made um, before <clears throat> the end of my next semester. So this map right here is an assessment of coastal inundation using just the 100-year storm event and seven-foot sea level rise. And what this map is showing you is the density of inundated structures, or the number per square mile, under just this scenario. So it's only looking at structures that are exposed to any level of water under this scenario. And it's important to note that this does not represent the maximum flood envelope. This goes past that envelope because it's formed as a, it is, um, made as a buffer. But the areas that you want to focus on are those in red. So those are greater than 1,000, a number per square mile. And some of our hot spots include Barrington, East Providence, Providence, Warwick. We have some red spots in, um, that's all up here in this area. We have some red spots in Newport down here in South Kingstown, and then down in Westerly. These maps are great because it catches your eye and you're, you can kind of see those hot spots more quickly, see which areas are going to be the most impacted by sea level rise, and in this case, sea level rise with a 100-year storm event. So hoping to get more of these maps out for the different scenarios. And so with that, I want to thank everyone, and I'll take questions, but also I just want to Give a special thank you to Jim and then my advisor, Dr. Pete August and Grover. Um, this project was an amazing opportunity. I've already learned so much um, in doing it, and I think it's so valuable for the state to have, so I'm really lucky to have been involved in this. So thank you. Questions for Nicole and Jim. Yes. Great presentation. A lot of great stuff, Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you understand why I didn't do that. <laughs> how do you propose, with all this information, how does a town or somebody start to assimilate this information? What do you do with it? How do you look at all these pieces? we got all kinds of interesting <clears throat> forecasts. Where do you start? Any ideas? Um, for me, I mean, I think the most valuable information, if you're an individual town, I would focus on those summary tables we made. So those are those structures that have commercial, residential, um, and then also we have our most important ambulance houses. Some of these towns have, have one uh, ambulance house and it's affected at one of these sea level rise scenarios. That one ambulance house is damaged, they kind of have to plan for what they're going to do next. Every town I'm sure knows um, their structures best and what is most important to them. But if I were <laughs> in charge of a town, a town planner, I would go in and see how many structures are under each category. So how many government buildings do we have? How many um, schools do we have? And then kind of start from there. Um, because every town is, is so different. Some have many schools, some only have two or three. But imagine having two or three of those schools be taken out. They kind of have to plan for that in the future. Igor, a great, great question, and, and frankly, the reason we wanted to do this analysis so that we had a starting point to begin this mm -hmm. conversation. I would suggest that with maybe just a, a very few communities of these 21 coastal communities actually have the capability to do this kind of analysis, and the time that Nicole has put into this project um, and the work that she's done is phenomenal. 
So it's really going to be uh, an asset to the entire state to have this database to begin these conversations. We have a complementary uh, project that's happening at statewide planning, looking at the impacts to people and the socioeconomic impacts. So these two studies will really complement one another and mm -hmm. um, really be a starting point for this conversation, as Grover said, along with the other tools that we're developing, is to bring an awareness to the community so they understand the magnitude of the impacts that are going to happen into the future. Now I'm thinking of insurance companies, insurance. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the interesting yeah. things too is that uh, we got statewide planning to give us their uh, spreadsheet of all the structures that are on the National Historic Register. Mm -hmm. So we were able to also bring that into the table and see which structures are going to be of risk as we go forward, which is something that historic preservation people are very interested in. Mm -hmm. Question, there's. Yeah, actually, uh, my name is James Willis. I'm with the DEM. Uh, we're going to be having another project kind of similar where we 